First of all, I would like to thank the office bearers of ISAM for giving me the opportunity to give this talk on some of our recent work. I would also like to thank the Department of Atomic Energy, Government of India for the Raja Ramana Fellowship allowing me to continue my work. The talk is going to be about the observation of an unexpected asymmetry in the angular distribution of negative ions produced from H2 and D2 through dissociative electron attachment. The results indicate the presence of a very unique process in electron scattering phenomena that has not been observed so far. It is the creation of a coherent superposition of two negative ion states of opposite parity in a molecule by electron attachment. As we know, all atomic phenomena are guided by angular momentum and spin conservation which gives rise to specific selection rules. These are very well characterized in optical phenomena which is dominated by the dipole selection rules. Any single photon absorption or emission has to have the angular momentum changed by one unit corresponding to the angular momentum of the photon and hence thus we get the dipole selection rules. Unlike optical phenomena, angular momentum transfer is not limited in particle collisions. An example is electron impact excitation of atoms and molecules where the limitations due to dipole selection rule does not do not arise. However, there is an exception to this where specific selection rules come into play. This is the process of resonant electromolecule scattering. The reason that there is no dipole selection rules in particle collisions can be seen for the case of electrons if we look at the plane wave expansion of a free electron. The plane wave can be expanded in terms of an infinite set of angular momenta as different from single photons. But then why should the resonant electron molecule scattering be restricted by angular momentum based selection rules? The reason is the following. In resonance scattering, a temporary negative ion state is created by the attachment of the electron to the molecule. In this situation, the initial and final symmetry has to be the same. That is, the symmetry of the free electron plus molecule should be the same as the symmetry of the negative ion state formed on electron attachment. The symmetry-based arguments were initially proposed by Gordon Dunn in 1962. The generalized selection rules for electron scattering on molecules of any given symmetry was laid out by Frank Reed. The same year, O'Malley and Taylor provided the detailed analysis of the DEA process and the selection rules for diatomic molecules. Azria and others from OSE showed the way to analyze the DEA process in molecules of C2B symmetry. Recently, this has been worked out for several polyatomic molecules in Bargoveram's thesis. And uh, today's talk, of course, we'll be covering mostly uh, more, uh, diatomics. But I wanted to say, add that, uh, for example, for diatomics, Dunn had uh, based purely based on symmetry arguments given some selection rules for electron attachment. And then Frank Reed had given the selection rules for electron scattering in general for molecules of all symmetries. Then O'Malley and Taylor is the one in 1968 provider for the uh, detailed uh, selection rules for the uh, he discussed the DEA process and gave detailed uh, selection rules for the uh, diatomic systems. And Azria et al. Uh, later on provided this again the selection rules for uh, C2, C2B symmetry molecules. And recently, uh, much later, when Bharga was a student for his PhD, he worked out several polyatomic molecules, the selection rules. Now, so what we are talking about is the selection rules coming from the, an orientation dependence in electron attachment. So when you have a plane wave of electrons approaching a molecules, now in a gas phase, we are talking about gas phase collisions, 
the molecules are all oriented in all possible directions there is no specific orientations but these electrons will attach only specific uh, molecules of only specific orientation at that means the with respect to the incoming electron beam only a certain uh, angle theta to which with at which the molecule is oriented is allowed now this directly limits the angular momentum which comes into play so you can all other way around and say that the molecules have a certain negative ion state a certain symmetry which has to be matched by the electron plus uh, neutral system and that limits the angular momentum so the now once you form a negative ion so this is a, we are talking about there is a specific orientation dependence for the electron attachment process now after the electron is attached it can decay by auto detachment so you get a scattered electron or it can decay by a dissociation in which you get a fragment negative ion so this is what we are going to look at is how the negative ion is formed and how it is evolved so you have a, in this case here you can see a auto detachment then you have a so basically you have a you can do by electron spectroscopy and you have, you have a dissociative attachment of course a new uh, recent uh, finding is that you can also have a dissociation follow, along with the electron ejection where you have a what is called a bond breaking by ca catalytic electrons so this was uh, theoretically it was proposed few years back and recently we showed it experimentally in one of the systems so the evolution of the negative ion resonance now we can look in terms of the uh, potential energy curves so what you have here is the neutral molecule ab and uh, electron uh, electron attachment you arrive at this ab star ab minus star is a uh, excited state so the molecular negative ion ab minus and which of course here i have shown it as a purely repulsive uh, curve and uh, which as a result it dissociates but this you see notice that there is a finite bit for this which represents the auto detachment process so you have an auto detachment with mass shown by a going back to the in either electronically excited state depending on whether there are excited electronic states or neutral below this curve or vibrationally excited states as shown by the green arrows until this point where you can continue uh, auto detachment and later on it dissociates to give a plus and b minus so what is not not in what is important here is that there is a competition between the auto detachment process and the dissociation process so you look at the dea cross section you have a, a function which is an exponential function which determines the final dea cross section given by this which is controlled by the ratio of the two lifetimes uh, or two time scales the dissociation time scale and the auto detachment uh, uh, times so this competition between these two process and it gives rise to various uh, strong isotope effect it shows a temperature dependence of the dea cross section even functional group dependence which we investigated uh, quite uh, extensively in last uh, 15 20 years and the chemical control uh, using uh, electrons now all this uh, comes into picture now one of the important thing when you talk about dissociation uh, followed by electron capture in order to understand the if you look at the dissociative products to understand the dynamics of the negative ion is that we just follow the axial recoil approximation it means is that the bending mode the molecule at the time of electron capture and by the time it dissociates it should not undergo any structural change so here i have shown an example of water molecule in this a particular uh, if the electron electron attachment you have a state and this particular bond which i am showing here h minus is ejected this is if it is ejected without any change in the bond angle it is axial recoil, recoil approximation that is uh, valid held but if suppose this molecule is undergoing vibration by the time this h minus is ejected then it is the axial recoil approximation is no more uh, valid so this is an important thing but here today when we are we will be talking about mostly a diatomic molecule so the when the vibration modes don't come into picture but you can have rotational effects but rotations are far too slow compared to even vibration so generally we don't see the rotational effects 
in the electron attachment uh, or the dissociative electron attachment process where we are going to look at the uh, now the uh, uh, little more about the angular distribution of the fragments which are formed from diatomic molecules so this as i said earlier it is uh, the theory worked out by omalian and taylor so what it gives us this angle you get the angle differential cross section here in terms of, of uh, 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 spherical harmonics our l and mu l is the angular momentum which has to be larger than the projection of the angular momentum on the inter in the, uh, the um, main molecular axis and mu is actually essentially the uh, i'm sorry I, i correct the lambda is the projection of the uh, l on the molecular axis and mu is the difference between the final state lambda and the initial state lambda and l has to be greater or equal to mu so this is the condition on l and that can go up to infinity so you get in principle you can have all spherical waves but generally what happens is that the lowest order partial waves dominate this attachment process so the whatever is the lowest l allowed value of l dominates so if you take the diatomics again there is a very specific rule which comes out is if you take homonuclear diatomics its l value only even l or only odd l values are allowed now if you have more than one resonance contributing at a given electron energy and which is contributing signals the dissociative attachment process at the, then you can have a sum of all the mu basically you all the you have a linear sum of all this all these terms which are which are coming into picture so as uh, shown here then we, let's look at the angular distribution for a uh, homonuclear diatomic molecule the simpler system which is h2 which we'll be talking about today more so if you h2 as a ground neutral h2 ground state is a single sigma g plus so if you have a uh, sigma g plus negative ion being formed for h2 minus then you have a l equal to 0 s wave capture so you get a isotropic angular distribution in the in the capture channel itself is isotropic and since there is no uh, there is axial recoil approximation on the while it is dissociating to give h minus you get a, again you get an isotropic distribution now if you go to the sigma u plus state what you are going to have is a, a p wave attachment what you are going to have a, in the zero and one eighty directions and similarly for other uh, symmetric uh, other states like a pi g state you get 45 degrees and for a pi u state you get a 90 degree angular distributions now when we did this measurement we had uh before we did hp adder the atomics let me show you some of the examples so the o2 and cl2 both are homonuclear atomics so these measurements were uh, done by dhananjay you can see that uh, the notable thing is of course you have as you change the electron energy you have a uh, momentum images or the angular distribution uh, let me tell you what this image represent basically the size of the image tells you the kinetic energy of the fragment negative ion and uh, the angular distribution of course you can see uh, from the pattern so the electron beam is going in the vertically from top to bottom direction so what is notable is that this is symmetric about the 90 degree direction there is no asymmetry in the about the 90 degree direction now you can see cl2 again cl2 r2 we are giving uh, there are uh, several states come into picture and uh, these are done by krishnendul and uh, you can see that uh, uh, here again there is no uh, is symmetric about the 90 degree direction there is no what in my mind is there is power three now let us look at two diatomic which are heteronuclear diatomics here again this is uh, uh this was done by dhananjay and uh, here it is done by ceo and, uh, and vishwesh so what you see here is of course here for the 
for this particular energy resonance what you have is there is a forward backward asymmetry in terms of the 180 degree signal and here of course these four lobes have a different uh, uh, there is an asymmetry but here what you have here is the more than one states come into picture especially here but even here only one state here there are two states but here the each of the state in this case two states come into picture because there are different partial waves coming in but they are not uh, they are going to each partial wave is giving rise to a different state or even in one of these state here there are two partial waves can come in because there is no inversion symmetry like in the case of h2 so we have l equal to odd and even both are allowed for this case so you can end up with a forward backward asymmetry as seen here and this is very strongly seen in the case of co is a, a single state on electron attachment with the multiple partial waves can give rise to a, a very strong forward backward asymmetry but because here the important distinction is between this and the one i am going to talk about h2 is that here you get a here there is no restriction there because in co or in the heteronuclear diatomic there is no inversion symmetry unlike h2 or homonuclear diatomic so the here the in heteronuclear diatomic you can have odd and even partial waves adding you going going contributing to a given resonance state but in homonuclear diatomics that is not possible this is what i wanted to stress through this uh, pictures so we all these images we obtain using a technique called velocity slice imaging which was uh, conceived and uh, built at tfr its success, first results we we got in some time in uh, in 2004 which were done by uh, dhananj built by dhananj and vaibhav uh, and uh, so the idea is following you have in a gas space electron beam interact with a molecular target here the molecular beam is produced by an effusive beam and electron beam is going is a magnetically collimated electron beam going perpendicular to the plane of the picture and the negative ions are produced here and uh, the electrons are coming in a, a bunch in a pulse form after the electron pulse goes away we can extract all the ions onto a position two dimensional position sensitive detector here held here and we you we apply the voltages on these electrodes and the time of flight tube in such a way that all the ions which are produced in the volume irrespective of where they are produced ions of a given velocity gets mapped onto the one point on the detector now you see this newton sphere which is propagating as, as shown here and arriving at the detector which basically gives rise to a time of flight spectrum here you this is the time of flight at arrival arrival ions at the detector now if you take this the central slice of this that means we are limiting the time of arrival to the central slice at a small time window and look at the ions which are dete are detected as a function of the position you get this velocity slice image so as i said earlier the velocity slice image gives you the speed of the ion which are with which they are produced or in terms of the kinetic energy and also the angular distribution so there is a, uh, a new setup which i built later on which is instead of a wet density panel which we used to read out the position of the uh, the ion strike in the detector we use a simple a phosphor screen and a ccd camera so we could uh, so that was the variation the detector here of course the slicing was done by pulse by pulsing the bias on the detector now we are going to talk about the electron attachment to hydrogen so hydrogen has basically three resonances one at 4 ev one broad resonance at around uh, centered at 10 ev and another sharp one at around 14 ev so these two resonances have been identified as a double sigma u plus and double sigma g plus based on the angular distribution measurements and this based on electron scattering data this resonance has been identified as a double sigma g plus resonance now one important thing i want to show you is that the 14 ev resonance the 4 ev i'm sorry the 4 ev and 10 ev resonance dissociate to give 
H minus and H in the ground state, whereas the 14 EV resonance dissociate to give H hydrogen atom in the N equal to 2 state. So most of the excess energy in the 14 EV has gone into exciting the hydrogen atom. So again, at 4 EV is the dissociation energy of H2. So you generally end up with a very low uh, kinetic energy at H at the 14 EV, just like in the case of a 4 EV, 4 EV resonance. So these are the potential energy curves. So you can see that the 4 EV resonance curve is here and the 14 EV resonance curve is uh, here is a purely repulsive curve. That's why we have a very broad uh, structure in the cross section. Uh, and the 14 EV is somewhere here. You can see there are several curves which people have indicated around the 14 EV range. So we look at the images of each of these uh, resonances. The 4 EV resonance image is shown here. And as expected, you can see that this is a forward backward peaking, which shows it's a, it has a sigma u symmetry. So that is consistent with what have been uh, discussed so far. And also you can notice that this, there is no forward backward asymmetry about the 90 degree uh, direction. Now you go to the 10 EV resonance uh, at various energies, you have, a, you have a rather similar structure, which again doesn't show a forward backward asymmetry. And this can be, these images can be fitted to give a sigma G plus symmetry uh, using uh, 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 multiple uh, partial waves in this case, or uh, even partial waves, S and D basically. But when we go to the 14 EV resonance, what we see is uh, rather strange uh, images, which of course show a forward and backward lobes which shows that it, is a, it has a sigma u symmetry, unlike the sigma g symmetry, which electron scattering that are showed. But more importantly, what we see here is that uh, there is a fo strong forward backward asymmetry in the images. So these are three energies I've seen. And for comparison, I'm giving you the uh, 4.5 EV, uh, 4 EV resonance data, it's just taken at 4.5 EV. So you can see that there is a very strong forward backward asymmetry. So this is very striking and uh, uh, very uh, uh, surprising results for us. And uh, more importantly, what we found is that the D2 seems to behave differently as compared to H2, confusing the issue further. So you can see, for example, D2, the, there is a slight asymmetry, which is in the other dire opposite direction as compared to H2. And the asymmetry seems to be changing for D2. But asymmetry is not very strong, but it's a changing direction. But there is here, for example, here you can see a, an asymmetry, like the same direction as that in the case of H2. But it's a different, uh, the magnitude of asymmetry is smaller. The question is, how do we explain this? Okay, before that, let me go to the explanation. Let me show you the table on the measured asymmetries. The asymmetry parameter we define as the forward minus backward intensity divided by forward plus backward intensity. So you can see that uh, at different electron energies, we have a minus 0.19, minus 0.17, minus 0.12 for H2, and 0 0.02, 0 0.03, minus 0 0.03, and minus 0 0.02, 0 0.08 for H2, sorry, D2. So the question we need to answer is, how do we get a forward backward asymmetry, or rather the symmetry breaking, for a homonuclear system, uh, molecule like H2. Why does the asymmetry change with the electron energy across the resonance? Why is the D2 different data different from H2 data? How did the electron scattering data indicated a sigma G plus symmetry for the resonance while the present data is more like a sigma U plus symmetry? So we are trying to find the answers to this in the rest of the talk. So this basically, this or the in the analysis, uh, basically was carried out by Vivo. The measurements I had done when I was uh, at the OU using this experiment I had built built uh, several years back. It took us few years to understand the results and uh, bring it to a to a level of publication. So that is where the Vivo's contribution came in. Now, how do we understand the, how do we break the symmetry? 
So in order to have the asymmetry, you need an odd term in the differential cross section. That's very simple to understand. So because we saw before for a single resonance in a, for a homonuclear system, you have a system like this. So only odd or only even values are allowed. So if you, even if you add another term, you are going to get even still a even function because is that it to be odd or even term? We have had a summing up. So you are not going to get an odd term in the differential cross section. The only way to get to odd term is by having this form of expression. Now you look at this. Here, what you have done is the square here, the square of the amplitudes here for a single resonance, we have taken it out and put it outside the for all the resonance. So now if you have two resonances. The combined amplitudes for the two resonances are going to add, and what we are going to eventually you can get an odd term in the differential angular uh, distribution. So, for example, H2 for the simplest thing is H2 sigma g plus going to an H2 minus in the combination of sigma g plus and the sigma u plus states. So, here you have a S wave attachment, here you have P wave attachment from the single same electron. One electron is transferring the partial two different angular moment to two different states. So you have basically when you take the differential cross section, you have this form a plus b cos theta odd square. So you get an odd cos theta term, which will give you a, a, a forward backward asymmetry. So the symmetry breaking now by coherent excitation. Let's look at a little more detail. So you have a incoherent excitation with the sum of two states are outside the, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is an incoherent sum here. So here you have a coherent sum of the amplitudes, then uh, you determine the cross section. So this is a difference in the, when you have a coherent excitation. So when we write the coherent sum by putting in the realistic amplitudes, you can get I, the differential cross section as a, uh, uh, y00 zero zero and y10. Now you can integrate over the phi azimuth because you have a cylindrical symmetry. So you which gives you a multi, uh, multiply, multiplier, so you can uh, get in terms of energy and angle at uh, this form of expression. The note that apart from cos theta, there is a cos, as another term cos delta, which is a phase difference between the two uh, channels. So this cos delta can, at, at time of attachment, delta can have two contributions. One is the inherent phase difference between the P and the S wave. And also what is called due to arising from uh, potential scattering, that as a plane wave comes and interacts with the molecule, there will be a distortion in the plane wave. So that can lead to a, a additional term in the phase factor for S and P waves. So both put together, you can have a cos delta term at the time of attachment. So this delta. Now what we have here is a you can have a during the attachment process itself you can have a forward backward asymmetry in the uh, signal in the the way the resonance state is uh, created. So what is important is that we have an asymmetry induced by a single electron creating a superposition of two resonance states. Now why does the very asymmetry change with the electron energy. So during attachment, as I said, we can have this uh, functional form. You see this cos delta here. Now, as the resonance state, the superposition state evolves and dissociate, or I said the wave packet evolves and goes to the dissociation limit, it takes two different paths because it is there are two distinct resonances. You can see there are two different paths it can take. But it going to the starting from the same point and goes to the same, uh, uh, end up at the same point. So you have two different quantum paths, which will, the two paths will introduce a phase difference between the two paths. So that is uh, a phase difference coming from the propagation. So what we are going to have is at the dissociation limit, you have a differential cross section, which has a phase factor now, uh, a cos phi factor. The phi will include basically this cos phi by this sort of azimuthal phi which we talked about, which is basically the phase difference between the two uh, channels, two resonance at the time, at the, at the ending with the, at the dissociation point. So phi, now phi has a dominant contribution from the dissociation paths 
and it is a function of electron energy. As the electron energy changes, the phi will change. There is a function of time. The time in the picture also there is a small change in the internuclear separation which has come into picture. So this phi here, presence of this phase difference leads to an interference structure in the forward backward asymmetry with electron energy. What I am trying to say that as the electron energy changes, this interference effect will modulate. It will keep. It will keep. It will, it will be changing. So that's why we see uh, the variation of asymmetry with respect to the incident electron energy. Now the question is, why is the D2 data different from H2 data? So when I initially we just discussed the dissociation attachment cross section. We I was trying to explain a, a factor which is an exponential factor depending on the uh, dissociation time and auto detachment time as given uh, here. Now D2 is heavier than H2, so you have already you have a factor root two difference in the time which stays for the D2 to dissociate compared to H2. So that means as the wave package for D2 evolves along the two different uh, paths to the dissociation limit, the phase which you are going to get the delta phase, or I should say that it was a, a phi. I think earlier I written and sorry it should be phi here. The phase phi will uh, change as compared to H2 and D2 and also it's changed with respect to electron energy. So the time which it's going to uh, be in the uh, change phase. So as I said the toy, the auto detachment time are different, could be different for two resonances. So this may lead to differing amplitudes. So now when you compare, you can compare this system with a simple uh, 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 optical uh, interfero, uh, interference uh, uh, system, interfer where you can get an interferogram. Now, assume that in these parts you have a uh, absorbing material, so which we can compare to the auto detachment decay of the two parts. So, what you are going to get is depending on the n1 and n2 or absorption in these two parts, you are going to end up with uh, uh, the contrast in the interference fringes uh, as in the case of. Uh, H2 and uh, D2. So this is summarized. So we are, uh, I'm giving here to the schematics of H2 and D2. So you have a attachment followed by evolution of the negative ion resonance to the dissociation limit. For, while it is uh, dissociating, it is undergoing auto detachment. So you have a, and there is a phase uh, difference along the two, dif uh, two different paths. So, which gives us a forward backward asymmetry, while D2 again, because the different mass, so the time evolution is different, so you get a, a, a different uh, a sort of a, a forward backward asymmetry. Now, how do we, we try to model this using uh, potential energy curves available in the, uh, available in the uh, literature. So we looked at it, there are some uh, uh, curves which have been identified. So one set of uh, curves given by Stibbe and Tennyson, then there is a uh, Buckley and Bocher have given uh, other set of curves. But again, these curves uh, doesn't really give the lifetime of the states and these are tentative uh, states. So we need to, but we, and in the absence of exact resonance state calculation, we use uh, selectively. Uh, two states from here and uh, two, the, this is a sigma, one state from the sigma G plus symmetry and one from the sigma U plus symmetry to model our uh, uh, observations. So the asymmetry parameter eta, as I defined earlier, is a forward intensity minus backward intensity divided by the total intensity. So assuming capture amplitude is the same and taking average lifetimes, lifetimes if you notice in the early one of the early earliest uh, uh, slide, the lifetime auto detachment lifetime is a function of the internuclear separation, internuclear distance. So we do not have the details. So what we take on is a average lifetimes. Assume an average uh, auto detachment lifetime for uh, 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 the uh, even symmetry state and uh, odd symmetry state. 
and then we calculate eta using the functional form of phi. Phi we can determine again. We have to assume the from the functional form of the potential energy curve. We can determine the phi in this in this form. So which you can eventually you can put it in and you can get a, a symmetry parameter eta based on the uh, potential energy curve and the lifetimes which we uh, use as a function of electron energy. Now the lifetime we don't know, but one of the resonances as electron scattering show the presence of a sigma g plus resonance and based on the width of the resonance which people have measured, we, have estimate, we can estimate the lifetime of the resonance average lifetime as 8 femtoseconds. So we use the lifetime for this even state and we use the lifetime of the odd state as a parameter and calculate the uh, uh, asymmetric parameter as a function of electron energy for H2 and D2. So what the color map is showing the asymmetric parameter start from both positive and negative and this is the electron energy and this is the lifetime of the odd state, that sigma u state we have uh, used. It ranges from 0 to 50, which you are using as a parameter in these calculations. And similarly for D2. So what is observed is as a function of energy, you can see there is a clear presence of an indifference uh, uh, in the oscillation of the, uh, uh, the uh, asymmetry parameter going from negative, positive, negative, positive. For a, any, any of the lifetime you see this, but of course you increase the lifetime of the sigma u state in this particular uh, system, you see that uh, says, okay, set of potential energy curves which we are used here, you see that it just sort of, the, the asymmetry starts vanishing slowly, the difference starts sort of vanishing because uh, as a function of time, as you said, uh, uh, decay uh, leads to a uh, reduction in the contrast. And for D2, you can see that it is, uh, again, you can have the more uh, 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 oscillation as a, uh, with a slow, uh, lower or uh, higher frequency in, the, uh, in, in, the, in terms of the energy domain, if you look at it. So as I said, we are using 8 femtosecond for the sigma G state and this is what we are getting. Obviously, if you look at these results, the simulation which we got, with the results which we get, is not consistent with what we observe because our results are somewhere the uh, close to close between 0.2 and uh, 0.1 is the asymmetry what we have measured. So we looked at uh, a more probable set of uh, potential energy curves. So let's look at the number which to remind you what the numbers what we are getting for the measured asymmetry between 0.2 and 0.1 and close to uh, 0 and 0.1 here in the case of D2. So now let us look at this uh, different set of potential energy curve, which again we are taken from the literature, we are taken a different uh, sigma u state, we are kept the same, but we are taken as different sigma g plus state and we, the lifetime is taken as 8 femtosecond and we again we model the asymmetry parameter whether using the same uh, type of calculation, so what, again as a function of the lifetime of the sigma u state, we get a uh, variation with energy in the asymmetry parameter in this form for H2 and in this form D2. So this seems to be fairly close to the observed, uh, we can generate a time scale here around 30 microsecond, which is uh, for the sigma u state which seems to be fairly consistent, at least in the ballpark of the asymmetry which we have measured for H2 as well as for uh, D2. So uh, that is the, uh, so we have basically what we have done is we have sort of simulated using model potential energy curves, the observed uh, experimental data. Now the question, one of the questions which I raised is why the electron scattering showed only sigma g plus symmetry while attachment measurement, electron attachment, the dissociative attachment show you a sigma u plus symmetry. So and this is one of the, the data I would like to show from the electron scattering which show the strong 14 EV resonance which people observed 
But what is important is here, this is the angular distribution of the scattered electron. And uh, of the 14 EV, the for, correspond to 14 EV resonance. So what you see here is that these are the electrons, the, the data points, and clearly you can have a, a, this fitted to a, a creation formation of a sigma u, um, sigma u resonance. But if one interesting which I would, thing which I would like to show you is that these are all using turntable experiment, turntable measurement where there is a strong limitation in the angular range one could reach unlike the current measurements which we are using where you can have a full spectrum whether it is a full spectrum of a, a full angular coverage of the negative ions of course this is for the electron scattering so what i want to show what let me not deviate from the uh, uh, point which i'm trying to make the scattering channel you get a sigma g they ob also observed as you here, for example, they state that they have a cha different second channel in which they were seeing some uh, slightly different angular distribution, which that indicate, but they were not able to, for various reasons, they did not uh, conclude anything other than it's a possible configuration of a sigma G plus for a second resonance in the same energy range. Now, this, of course, uh, I believe that it has to do with the uh, problems in the measurement. So why the difference? We can look at in a very simple way. Auto detachment time scale. Now what we are talking about is uh, for the sigma g state was 8 femtosecond. And what we measured for the sigma u state is 30 femtosecond. So it is very likely that uh, on the auto detachment channel will be dominated by the sigma g resonance. and and our dissociation channel which be dominated by the sigma u uh, resonance. So this is what we see in the, if you look at the momentum images so H minus, it is a forward backward signal which is indicative of the sigma u symmetry, but whereas the electron, uh, sigma g symmetry, I'm sorry, sigma u symmetry, whereas this, I'm sorry, this indicated, uh, I, I'm sorry, I was telling you this should be a sigma g state, sigma electron scattering should a, sigma g symmetry this is the sigma u is here because they were looking at the 14 ev resonance decaying to a b sigma u state so where there is a p uh, it's a uh, dipole l equal to one transition that's where your the outgoing uh, electron has a p wave but effectively is a resonance is a sigma g resonance then only you get this angular distribution so i i, I think i made a as error in while discussing. So basically in the electron scattering channel, the sigma G plus resonance and uh, dominating it. And in uh, D, DEA channel, it is dominated by sigma U. So the, it is sort of explains the, the difference between the electron scattering and the uh, uh, dissociative uh, electron attachment channel. So there have been other measurements on the uh, interference in, uh, in, ter in terms of total cross section in uh, electron attachment around these resonances, both at 10 EV and 14 EV. So, these measurements, for example, around 14 EV, you see the discrete structure in the uh, 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 DEA cross section. Of course, this was measured at 90 degrees, and uh, but uh, only at a fixed angle, and they saw this structure which they said that there is a interference between uh, two uh, resonances which they associate with uh, a delta G state dissociate uh, dissociate through a decaying through a pre dissociation to a sigma G plus state. But in our measurement, we look for this this structure. We should have seen this structure at 90 degree in our uh, images. We fail to see this. Okay, we may see that, uh, we may say that possibly uh, we do not have enough momentum uh, resolution. That may be a possibility, but still we tried our best to see such a structure. We are not seeing this structure. So we do not know the, at present we do not know the source of this uh, particular resonance. This resonance structure which have been seen in the, uh, the, uh, the cross-section for the now let me before i go to the 
uh, end of my talk, let me uh, raise another question. This is to do with the lifetime of the uh, two states. Now we say that uh, the electron attachment creates the superposition of two states uh, or even state. Now this should ideally it should be treated as a single state. So what happens to the, how do we treat the lifetime of the single state? Or that means is the lifetime of one state affecting the lifetime of the other state? That's the question. So this question has been addressed in a different context in the optical transitions by Freshman and Shapiro. So they say that uh, you can have a, you can have a two uh, uh, superposition of two states which decays and they show that it essentially has to the lifetime of the combined system has to oscillate. That means ideally you will have a, uh, you will have the, uh, the lifetime of auto detachment, lifetime of one state affecting the auto detachment, lifetime of the other state. But this is something which worried us a lot before we published the manuscript. We didn't have a clear cut answer whether it is present or not. But when you look at the experimental data, it seems that this affecting one state affecting the other state through auto detachment process doesn't seem to be there in the, at least in the experimental data. So that's as such, as I showed you, this is also explains why the electron scattering or dominating the sigma g uh, symmetry and the uh, attachment uh, dissociative electron, the negative ion formation channel dominating the sigma u channel. That also shows that the two resonances, the lifetimes are not really affected by the super creation of the superposition state in the initial stages. The possible reason is that the lifetimes, the widths of the resonances are fairly small compared to their separation. So most of the thing they are evolving to quite different uh, paths. So maybe that is the reason why the lifetime uh, question doesn't come into picture. But this is something which we need to still worry about. I think that this is an interesting problem in the electron attachment process and resonances. If there is a coherent excitation of two resonances, how the lifetime is going to evolve. So to conclude, what we have seen is there is a symmetry breaking in dissociative electron attachment, which arises from the coherent creation of two resonances and the two paths, obviously, in, uh, there are two different paths. So you have a quantum interference. It leads to contra the contrast in the interference fringes, which depends on the relative phase, lifetime of each resonance and the isotopic composition. So we need to have, what we need is calculations of the potential energy curves and their widths. They are, even though H2 minus is the simplest system one can think of as far as the negative ions are concerned, molecular negative ions are concerned. Still, there are not enough calculations available. In fact, measurements on HD is being carried out by WIFA and his team and TIFR right now. We are looking forward to the results from that. You would like to have measurements on vibrationally excited H2. Now that if you have a vibrationally excited H2, you can have a, you, you will basically, you will be uh, going through a different time scales, which are, which are uh, different from uh, uh, whether in H2, HD or D2, what we can arrive at right now. And so that would be very interesting because we are going to have a different Frangordan factors, Frangordan region, and what is, so how, how it is going to manifest in the, uh, the electron attachment for uh, process of the protein will be very interesting. Very important thing is we will, it would be ideal to have a measurement with a higher momentum resolution. The bottleneck in this case right now is the electron energy resolution. If you could make this measurement with a, a better energy resolution, that would be great. And the question is, which in my mind is, are there more instances of coherent effects in electron attachment in uh, molecules, or is this the one of a kind unique situation? So before I conclude, let me acknowledge almost all my colleagues, basically my students and other colleagues. So as I said, Dhananjay and Vaibhav, Dhananjay was the main person who built the experiment and Vaibhav has been the cornerstone, basically the pillar of interpreting most of the results. And Bhagavad Ram again have uh, the, all the polyatomic molecules measurements were carried out. 
by uh, most of them, I'd say, headed out by Bhargav and later on by Vishwesh and Krishindu. And Sramana, of course, worked with me on a totally, and Dali was a postdoc, they worked on a totally different problem on the <laughs> electron collisions and content space. And we have other other colleagues, Aravind did photo detachment experiment. We have, we, just for Aravind, I built the photo detachment experiment and now he's continuing those measurements in IIT Chennai. And of course, we have other colleagues, Aditya had other uh, projects. He did a project when we are doing the measurements on uh, molecular where Vaibhav came up with the, came up with the uh, function group dependent uh, in, uh, results on uh, DEA process. So Aditya is a major contributor to that. And Sangeeta spent a few years, unfortunately, she went away before completing the, her PhD. And uh, uh, Atik had done a lot of measurements with, on uh, ionization cross-section with me. And uh, he is uh, yet to complete his, he is waiting for his thesis completion. And Prashant did uh, very nice measurements on uh, absolute cross-section for uh, water, ammonia, and methane. And of course, Sadiq was the first one with whom I worked with. I, I will not say, of course, Nagesha was the first one with I worked with uh, negative attach, electron attachment, but Sadiq was the one with worked on excited state collision in uh, excited state electron attachment in collaboration with SVKK. And of course, we had Ashoka as a uh, collaborator, as a postdoc at that time. And Bhas was, of course, uh, my first student in TFR as he, uh, we were busy with the looking at the two, uh, two electron processes in H2 and helium. And Krishnamurti and Safwan have been uh, as good as my students, helping me on several in, uh, instances and also uh, have some uh, publication in uh, uh, as recently as few years back with MK. And uh, Sajeev have been a collaborator from uh, BRC on uh, theoretical calculations. Amber and Ramchandran has helped us, especially Amber is the, and Ramchandran, they, they contributed to the data acquisition system when we originally developed the velocity slice imaging at TIFR. And Ananda Krishnan was another contributor in terms of the data acquisition system for measuring the various cross section, including the excited state measurement, which is Sadiq and Ashoka uh, did. And we had some, I had some international collaborators like uh, Eugen Ellenberger from Berlin, Bern Nesman who did theoretical calculation for NO. And he also uh, dis uh, did some calculation for H2, but we did, we did not, it, was, it, didn't, uh, it, don't, it didn't reach completion. And uh, Mason, of course, the main collaborator for the H2 measurement, which uh, where I, in Open University, where we did the measurement. And H H2 absolute cross-section for DEA, we had, collaboration with the Stefan Benefil who are visiting us from Innsbruck and Isto Cades and his collaborator from Slovenia. And of, of, of course, uh, Odu Ringolfsson was another collaborator from Iceland. His student came and did all his thesis for his thesis work. He did the measurements with the, on the machine I built at, at the uh, uh, Open University. And uh, uh, and we had several papers coming out of that, which I know uh, mentioned in this. So these are, I, I would like to thank all my students and other collaborators and uh, thank you all once again for your patience. Thank you.